Hello, I'm Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University uh, Extension Service in Hancock County. Uh, today I am going to talk about scouting for insects and disease in the home landscape. And this presentation is in response to a question about identifying different kinds of damage from different kinds of insects. And so a lot of what we'll be talking about is the sorts of damage that you might see uh, on different kinds of plants, uh, different kinds of insect feeding uh, that might be a sign that you need to look for things. And we're going to talk about kind of the same thing for uh, diseases as well. Uh, so one of the things that I, I really think is important is, is scouting in the home landscape, is using our senses to go out there uh, and see what's going on with our plants. And, and why I think that's so important is that it allows us to detect problems before they become really serious. It allows us to you know, you know, find insect populations when they're very small or disease infestations when they're, when they're just affecting a single plant or a few plants. And oftentimes when we have those populations at, at a very low level, it, we have a lot more options in terms of how we're going to manage that pest. If it's a single insect, you may be able to simply pick it up and get rid of it. Uh, a single disease, you know, a single disease lesion on a single leaf, you might be able to just prune that away and get rid of it. As those populations become larger, uh, whether we're talking about insects or disease, the options that we have in order to effectively manage them are going to be reduced. We're going to have to uh, use different uh, different pesticides, things like that. Um, so ideally, we'll we'll get you know get to those insect or disease problems very early in their development, and that'll make managing them a lot easier. Uh, one of the things that is also really important uh, when we're talking about scouting for problems in the home landscape. Uh, and, and this particularly uh, for diseases, uh, it's really important to know the plants that we have in our landscape, uh, know what they look like, what color of green we expect them to be, uh, how we expect them to grow. Uh, and you know, along with that, we're going to understand a lot of the common insect problems or common disease problems that we might have on that particular plant. Uh, so, you know, what kind of plant is it? What is normal for the growth of that plant? Uh, and that's really going to allow us to figure out when something might be going wrong. And I have uh, two pictures here. Uh, one of these is a picture of a, a perfectly normal variegated plant. So that plant would naturally have, uh, you know, sections of the leaves that are going to be that different color. Uh, unfortunately, the other picture uh, is of a plant uh, that's affected by a virus uh, that causes that same sort of, you know, uh, sections of different color uh, kind of modeling effect that we would see. And if I don't know what that plant looks like normally, it, it's really difficult to identify that problem. And, and unfortunately for me, um, when I was putting these images up, I, I don't remember which image is which. Uh, so knowing which, you know, knowing which problem I have or knowing what plant I have, what that plant should look like is going to be really important uh, when we're trying to figure out why a plant might not be performing uh, in the home landscape. So there are all sorts of different problem signs that we can look for. Uh, we may have uh, you know, some sort of deformation of the leaves. They may be cupped. Uh, the edges of the leaves may be kind of uh, pulled upwards. Uh, they may be yellowed, or we use the fancy word there, chlorotic, which is, is just a fancy way of saying, uh, saying yellowed. Uh, we may have spots on the leaves. There may be parts of the plant that are malformed. Uh, all sorts of different uh, shapes of the leaves. Uh, we may have areas of plants in the home landscape if we have a large planting uh, where the plants aren't performing as well or they may be, uh, may be dying down. Of course, we also want to look out for insects, uh, look, at, look at how many of those insects we have in that landscape. Uh, 
Um, but really what we're looking for, and the, the important lesson here is, is we're looking for things that are out of the ordinary. Uh, you're going to know your home landscape better than anyone else. You, you get to go out there and enjoy it and spend time with it. So as you start to notice things that are out of the ordinary, we want to investigate that and figure out what could be the problem. So when we should start scouting is really simple. As soon as our plants start growing, we should start keeping an eye on them. And we should really keep an eye on them until any possibility of there being a pest present is passed. So for most of us, that's going to be when the plants are coming out of dormancy in the spring. Uh, and all the way through the fall, if we're talking about landscape plants and perennials, uh, if we're talking about vegetables from when they emerge as seedlings, uh, all the way through the last time that we harvest them. And generally, you know, of course, we want to spend as much time in our landscape as we possibly can, um, but really intentionally going out and looking for problems once a week is a really good practice. Uh, just taking some time to go out uh, and really investigate and see if you've got anything going on. Now, if we've started to notice there be a problem, uh, then it's a good idea to increase that frequency, to, to go out and look for that more often. Uh, and that's going to allow us to kind of see how that problem might be evolving over time. Are, are we seeing more insects? Are we seeing more kinds of disease lesions? Um, and, a, and another side of that is once we have applied a control for a particular problem, uh, whether that be an insect or disease, we want to go back out there uh, and scout again uh, just a few days afterwards. And that's going to allow us to figure out if that method of control has been effective in dealing with our problem. Uh, now, I've already said to, to know your plants, it's also really important to know your pests. Uh, so, when we're talking about insects, I'm going to talk about insects for a little while now. Uh, knowing the pests that are very commonly showing up on the plants that you grow in your landscape is a very valuable tool to identifying them, knowing what kinds of problems you're going to experience with them. And a lot of that comes down to different pests requiring different treatments you're going to want to apply a, a very different control uh, for the stink bug or uh, tomato hornworm, really tobacco hornworm, uh, that you see in these images uh, than you would for something like aphids, because different treatments are going to you know, respond, or different pests are going to respond better to different treatments. Uh, one of the things that I really encourage people to do, uh, if they have an unfamiliar insect in their garden or in their landscape, uh, you can take a picture of it, uh, do our best to, to get that picture in focus and, and really you know, get, send us a good image. But all of the county extension offices uh, would uh, be very happy to help you identify those pests, uh, as well as uh, give you a recommendation for what the most effective control is going to be for dealing with that specific problem. Now, when we're talking about scouting for insects, there are some things to keep in mind. So it, it is a good idea to know the entire life cycle for the pest, from egg uh, to its immature stage to its adult. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we wanna talk about when and where it causes plant damage. So some insects are prone to show up at particular times. We have insects that may show up early in the season, insects that may show up later in the summer. and all of that is going to allow us to figure out how many pests there are, uh, whether we actually need to take action. A, a single individual may not be a, be a significant problem, but when you have a lot of them, uh, it can be really important. Uh, some important things for scouting for insects is really the process of going out there and looking for them. You know, as, as we're walking around our landscape, if we just pay attention to uh, the, the tops of the leaves and the, the upper canopy, there's a lot of stuff that we could possibly miss. So it's a good idea when we're going out there and scouting to pay attention to some areas we may not look at every time we go out into the landscape. So uh, turning over some leaves and looking on their underside, 
uh, looking in shaded or protected areas of the landscape is a really good practice uh, because again, you know, sometimes insects will favor those environments uh, rather than uh, you know, really being obvious or on tops of the leaves, things like that. And while you know, I, I don't expect everyone to go out and, and make counts of every insect that they find, having a pretty good general idea of what we're looking at in terms of that population can be really important. Uh, now, I mentioned insect life stages. I want to just take a, a moment to talk about that because insects can look very different at different stages of their life. Uh, of course, we can always tell the adult insects because only the adults have wings. Uh, that lets us know right away that we're dealing with an adult. Uh, but different insects in our landscape may either go through incomplete metamorphosis, uh, and you see this in things like grasshoppers or stink bugs where they, they hatch out of the egg uh, as essentially what looks like a miniature version of the adult that, that doesn't have wings. And then they'll go through several molts or instars until they reach their adult size, have wings, uh, and, and that would be the adult for those insects that go through incomplete metamorphosis. In complete metamorphosis, uh, that's kind of what we normally think about when we think about an insect going through its life cycle. So it starts off as an egg. Uh, it's going to uh, turn into a larva, which we might call a caterpillar or a maggot or, or a variety of other possible names. Uh, it's then going to go into a pupal stage. And that's kind of a resting stage where it's metamorphizing into the adult. Uh, the example that I have there in an image is a moth, but we see this same thing in flies or beetles and in a range of other insects. So just to, to kind of get back to talking about sampling, one thing that, that is important to consider is the status of an insect or even a, a disease really as a pest is dependent on population. So uh, you know, the more plant pests we have there, the more of those insects that are present, the more damage they're going to do. Uh, so it may not be reasonable to, to spray or provide a control every time there, there's an individual insect. Uh, so we really want to watch for those populations and see as they're increasing. And what we're trying to do is to, is to keep the population of those pests, whether that again, insect or disease, uh, below a threshold where they're going to cause enough damage for us to be concerned with. And I've talked about this with you before, uh, where we talk about what's called an economic injury level. In the case of landscape plants, a lot of times that can, it can be kind of hard to put a price on uh, the plant. We're not planning on using the produce of it or anything like that. So we also talk about what's called an aesthetic injury level. Uh, and you can see the line there on this graph where we have uh, sort of a line across there of where we would actually see some sort of loss uh, due, to the, uh, due to a population level of that pest. And the majority of the time, that population level is below that, uh, that threshold. When it raises up above that, above that threshold, we need to apply some sort of control uh, in order to, again, re you know, reduce that population down to a point where it's not causing any damage. Now, talking about scouting, uh, there is a tool we can use, particularly for uh, small flying insects. Uh, professionally, when we're out scouting, sometimes we will use little uh, yellow sticky cards. Uh, sometimes those are different colors, uh, but yellow is, is fairly common. Uh, and we use those to detect the, the adult stages of things like aphids or thrips, uh, white flies, even uh, leaf miners. Uh, they're attracted to that colorful cup. And so what we do is we have it covered in a sticky material. Uh, Tanglefoot would be an example of that. Uh, and as those insects are drawn in, they get stuck onto that cup. We can come back later and, and take a look at it. And that can allow us to say, you know, the aphids have shown up or leaf miners have shown up and kind of give us an idea as well of how that population is changing over time if we have that sticky trap out there in the garden long term. 
Uh, one thing that's really important when we think about sticky traps is occasionally you'll see recommendations uh, that they be used as a, a way to control insects. Uh, and that's not really effective. We're never going to catch enough of the bugs to really be effective as a way to keep that population down. But what it does let us know is that we have that population show up. So we might start to see uh, white flies stuck to it. And that's going to let us know we really need to keep an eye on our plants for having those white flies. We might see aphids or other insects like that. And that's just, again, a key for us. I, I know I've got them in here. I, I know they've shown up. I'm starting to see more of them. So I really want to take a look at my plants and, and see if I have this problem. Uh, so insects feed on plants in a variety of different ways. Uh, the two most common that we're going to, and, and the two we're going to talk about are, are insects that chew on the, the leaves. They have uh, uh, mandibles, mouth parts, kind of the same way we do. Uh, they chew up their food. Uh, we also have insects that have piercing sucking mouth parts. Uh, we always compare that to a mosquito, uh, just because here in Mississippi we are all familiar with that. Uh, what they do with those piercing sucking mouth parts is they, they draw out plant sap or they, they go after seeds in some cases, uh, and they cause different kinds of injury. Uh, so when we're looking for insect damage, we need to look for a few different things. Uh, we need to first see where is the damage uh, that we're seeing. We might be seeing damage on leaves. We might be seeing it on branches. Uh, it's even possible that we would see it on roots if we're really uh, investigating very closely. Uh, but, you know, the, the most common place we're going to be looking is going to be at the leaves and maybe a little bit less as we look at the branches. Uh, and we're also going to see different kinds of damage. We may see defoliation where there's feeding on the leaves. Uh, we may see stippling, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we may see sawdust at the bottom of the trunk of a tree as a result of wood boring. Uh, and if we're lucky, the actual pest will still be there. Uh, and we can easily identify it. Uh, so chewing insects cause damage in a whole bunch of different ways. So we'll talk about all of these uh, it kind of in turn, just to kind of give some examples of what you might be running into and what you might want to look for as a result of seeing this. Um, all sorts of different kinds of insects uh, are defoliating or chewing, uh, feed by chewing. Uh, Lepidoptera, or the, the butterflies and moths, uh, of course, are, are very common pests in gardens. Uh, you can see a picture there uh, the middle of the uh, right side of the screen. Uh, Coleoptera, or the beetles, uh, also very common pests on a lot of landscape plants. We'll talk a little bit about flea beetles and how they feed. Uh, probably uh, not one we often think about are the Hymenoptera, or, or the wasps and, and bees. Uh, but sawflies uh, are defoliating pests on some plants like hibiscus. Uh, and you can see a picture of a sawfly that looks very much like a caterpillar up there in the top right. Um, you also have uh, orthoptera or the, the uh, grasshoppers. Uh, um, you know, of course, they're uh, famous as leaf feeders. Um, and another one we don't commonly think of are the diptera or the true flies. Uh, but some of our leaf miners uh, are members of the, the order that, that includes flies. Uh, so one kind of feeding that we may encounter is what we call shot hole feeding. Uh, you can kind of see from this picture how it gets that name. Uh, looks like the leaves just has a lot of small holes all, uh, all around it. Uh, this is an example of feeding by a, a small beetle called a flea beetle. Uh, picture's not in, uh, in very good focus, um, but flea beetles get their name because their hind legs are, are kind of enlarged and they can actually jump. Uh, they very typically uh, cause this kind of feeding where you see these sort of small round holes on the, on the surface of the leaves. So if you see this, it's a good idea. You're either looking for something like that, uh, but you'll also see uh, a variety of other beetles uh, leaving uh, feeding injury like this. Uh, and occasionally you will see some small caterpillars, uh, particularly caterpillars feeding on the underside of, lead, of leaves uh, when you see this kind of damage. 
Uh, skeletonizing is, is kind of a step up from that. Uh, in skeletonizing, uh, what's going on is, is you have feeding that is, is leaving just the leaf veins behind. So the, the caterpillar usually, uh, or in some cases, even a, a sawfly or a beetle uh, will come along and feed and, and just feed on all of that softer tissue, uh, leaving behind the, uh, the, the harder veins. And you kind of see that network there in that picture on the right. Um, but again, you're really looking for a pest. Uh, you know, usually that's going to be a caterpillar, uh, but you may see some other, uh, other insects doing that as well. Uh, window painting is, is really interesting. Uh, they, uh, the insect feeds on the plant, leaving, you know, feeds on the, the mesophyll. They kind of leave the inside of the leaf uh, remaining there, which kind of leaves a, a, a very thin, actually see-through uh, part of the leaf remaining there. It's really very frequently a sign of early instar caterpillars, uh, so caterpillars that are really, uh, really still quite small. Uh, haven't grown up to, to be bigger and able to eat through the entire leaf. Uh, you may also see this with some beetle species or sawfly species uh, as a way to, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, smaller species tend to be where you see this. Uh, a very common problem, particularly on arcanas, is the leaf roller or leaf folders. Uh, leaf rollers, of course, get their name because they roll up the leaf kind of uh, makes a protective area for them in there. Uh, so not only do they have all the food they could ever want, but they have protection from predators or from the environment. Uh, and you can see the picture there on the left, as that leaf unfolds, uh, it leaves that really characteristic kind of line of holes uh, that was made you know, right when the, uh, you know, when the leaf was still rolled up as it was developing. Uh, canna leaf roller is absolutely the most common example of this that we're, uh, we're likely to run into. Uh, but there are some other insects as well uh, that kind of do the same thing. Uh, usually they're uh, in a group of, uh, of the butterflies uh, called skippers. That's what the canna leaf roller is. Uh, you may also, uh, if you're uh, going around your garden, you occasionally will see leaves folded over. Uh, with a little bit of webbing on them. Uh, and when you open it up, there's a small spider inside of there. Uh, they're kind of doing the same thing. They're, they're you know, giving themselves a protected area in the, uh, uh, using the leaf to do that. Uh, leaf miners, uh, really probably the most common problem that I get brought when talking about citrus trees. Uh, and you can see there on that, the citrus tree on the, the top of the screen uh, and the uh, tomato leaf down there at the bottom of the screen, uh, the citrus leaf miner comes along, the same as the, the serpentine leaf miner, and they lay an egg on the leaf, uh, and the immature insect goes in there uh, and bores uh, into the leaf and then just makes tunnels as it, as it feeds. Uh, and Generally, this, this isn't a huge problem for a lot of plants, uh, but it can be quite unattractive. Uh, and at higher levels, it can be damaging and a little bit more difficult to manage uh, because the insect is in a protected area as it feeds. Uh, but uh, one of these is a, uh, is a kind of moth and one of them is a kind of fly, uh, just two different insects, uh, really doing kind of the same thing uh, and generally being treated the same uh, because of it. And, and when you treat for this, it can be a little bit difficult to figure out if you've got an effective control because, of course, the insect isn't really apparent to you. Uh, so what you really want to look at is uh, whether you see the, those leaf mines expanding, uh, and that lets you know that you, uh, you, if they're not expanding anymore, that lets you know the problem's taken care of. Of course, we also do have some, some tent making uh, insects. Uh, both of these are caterpillars. Uh, they make large silk tents on trees. Uh, the two most common ones are the eastern tent caterpillar. Uh, the other one is the fall webworm. Their behavior is a little bit different. Uh, the uh, fall webworm tends to stay inside of all of that. Uh, all of that webbing and feed inside of it. The eastern tent caterpillar will explore a little bit more uh, outside of that webbing. 
um, and the eastern tent caterpillar tends to show up in the spring, uh, whereas the fall webworm tends to show up in the fall, which is again just a, a really good kind of thing to, to make a note of. You know, time of year is, is really going to influence uh, what you might see in terms of the insects that are in your landscape. Uh, another kind of feeding that you might see is notching. Um, you know, the, again, a, a range of different insects can do this. Uh, you can see a grass up. A notching would be feeding around the outside edge of the leaf. Uh, you can see the grasshopper there in the, the top left uh, feeding on the edge of the leaf. Uh, that bottom picture on the left is actually a result uh, of feeding by a kind of, of beetle. Uh, that's uh, that it's kind of weevil that, that makes those uh, uh, injuries in the leaf from the edge inwards. Uh, and then really interesting, that's a leaf cutter bee. Uh, they actually come and make those really characteristic sort of uh, circle shaped cutouts of the leaf uh, that they use as nesting material. Uh, so uh, kind of again, a, a range of different things uh, and can often be kind of difficult to figure out what's going on. Uh, because oftentimes the insect that caused this damage uh, really isn't going to be apparent. And now, in addition to all of our chewing insects, we also have our sap feeding or piercing and sucking insects, uh, like the, the thrips. Uh, again, you can uh, uh, win Jeopardy someday uh, by remembering that the singular form of thrips is thrips. Uh, you also have all of the hemiptera or true bugs uh, that, that includes a really wide range of different species that can be uh, problems on plants from aphids uh, to uh, the stink bug that you see here, uh, or even the, uh, the immature leaf-footed bug. Uh, you also have uh, a range of different mite species that can be problems. Um, and, and damage from piercing sucking insects you may not be quite as obvious as immediately as you would see from chewing insects, but as the population increases, you're going to see this more and more. Uh, and, and as I talked about sampling, it, it's particularly important with these insects, uh, particularly things like aphids or thrips or white flies, uh, to, uh, to take a look on the underside of leaves uh, because they do tend to aggregate there. They, they tend to hang out on the underside. And uh, one of the first things you may see, particularly for, for mites and some other of these insects, or mites or, or not insects, but um, pests, uh, is what we call stippling. So you'll start to see little white spots on the tops of the leaves, uh, and that's a sign that you have that piercing sucking insect. Uh, wherever it, it feeds on the plant, it kind of draws out the, uh, the color. Uh, along with it, along with it as it's as it's feeding, uh, gives you that stippling effect. Uh, azalea lace bug would be a really good example of this, uh, where you see that that stippling very clearly on the top of the azalea leaves. Uh, you may also see a general yellowing of the plant. Uh, you can see the the bottom picture or the, the middle picture there, uh, where you have that that yellowing starting. Uh, where again, where that feeding is going on, or even in the bottom picture, you can see that yellowing on the fruit as a result of that feeding. Uh, once the feeding, you know, if there are a lot of them uh, drawing out plant, plant sap, you may see the plant begin to wilt. Uh, you may see leaves being deformed if they were fed on as they were being, uh, as they were growing, uh, because the, the dead cells that were fed on just can't ex expand as much. Uh, as the plant is growing. Uh, there again, you can see a little bit of leaf deformation down there at the bottom. Uh, you can see how those leaves are curled around. Uh, you can also see very often as a result of feeding by piercing sucking insects, uh, what we call honeydew on the plants, uh, which is just gonna be a sticky substance, uh, looks wet. If you have a severe infestation in a tree, uh, it's even possible that you'll you'll have it dropping down on you as the insects feed. Uh, and we want to get rid of that honeydew uh, because honeydew can uh, result in sooty mold on the plant, uh, which is that black fungus you see in the top right. 
uh, which is really a, a very strong sign that we have a lot of piercing sucking insects. Uh, they're uh, introducing that honeydew or, or exuding that honeydew. Uh, and that fungus likes to come along and, and live on that really sugary substance uh, and uh, turn the plant black and really unattractive. Uh, we may actually see uh, wax material or cast exoskeletons on the plant. Uh, every time the insect molts, it leaves behind uh, its cast off exoskeleton. Uh, and that may kind of get stuck in that honeydew. Uh, and so we may see a little white remnants of that on the plants uh, as a really good sign that we're starting to have a serious problem with piercing sucking insects. Um, getting away from that, uh, we also have insects that forms, form galls on plants. Uh, probably the most common one we're going to see in the landscape is going to be pecan phylloxera. Uh, if you have a pecan tree, uh, you will see this eventually. And you can see those um, kind of large, uh, kind of wart-like structures on the leaves. Uh, and the insects are, are protected inside of there. Uh, there are examples of uh, different flies and different wasps that form galls. Uh, the, the picture there in the, the top right uh, is a, uh, a, a fly gall on, a, on goldenrod. Uh, it tends to be something that not, doesn't often tend to be something that we're growing in our landscape, um, but that's just a really good example. Uh, and of course, oak galls uh, we frequently see on leaves and on stems and other things like that. Uh, as a result of wasps that form different galls on the plants. All right, so we want to take a little bit of time and talk about disease. Uh, of course, we want to go and signs of disease. I uh, want to uh, go back and just uh, very quickly mention uh, what a disease is. I get to show my favorite picture of disease. That, that's a rose mosaic. Uh, but a disease is just an impairment of the normal state of the plant uh, that interrupts or changes its vital function. Uh, so a really wide range of things can be considered uh, a disease. Uh, some important things that we wanna consider when we think about scouting for disease is that the environmental conditions that we have going on are really, really important for the development of disease. So, how much rain we're getting, how humid it is, what our temperature is, are all things you want to keep in mind when you're scouting for disease. Um, particularly when we've had a, a period of time like we have here in Hancock County uh, of having a, you know, a, a fair amount of rain um, that, that leads to a lot of free water being on the plants. Uh, so the, you know, the leaves are wet for long periods of time. The temperatures are fairly high. Uh, and that gives us a, a very good environment for the development of disease. Uh, we might remember from, from previous conversations uh, that you really need that long period of time, more than six hours of the leaves being wet uh, for fungal and, and bacterial problems to really set in. Uh, so keeping an eye on the weather can be really important. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're you know, inspecting the foliage, but also looking at the bark or the trunk and limbs of the tree. Um, not only noting you know, where we see a problem, but you know, if we have a lot of plants, you know, how many plants are affected. And uh, it's really important, you know, going back to that idea of knowing your plants and knowing your landscape, because uh, we wanna be able to see you know, if the plants maybe not growing as much as it should, uh, if uh, one section of plants is yellower than another area, uh, and are we seeing that uniform on all of the plants that we're growing, uh, or is it just you know one specific area or one specific plant? Uh, kind of that you know going back to talking about the environment, uh, you know, that long period of, of wet weather again kind of gives us that idea of a favorable environment. Uh, but we also want to know the pests or, or the diseases that affect that particular plant uh, as best we can, because that's going to give us a lot of information. And you know, that goes back to we we need the host for the disease, we need that favorable environment, we need the pathogen present in order for disease to occur. Uh, as I mentioned, disease can be caused by a, a lot of different things. We have what we consider abiotic diseases. Uh, which are not caused by an organism. Uh, 
Uh, and then biotic diseases, which are caused by some sort of organism that is infesting the plant. Um, abiotic diseases, there's a, a range of things that we may encounter. Uh, one of the things that we may see are plant nutrient deficiencies. Uh, there are some pathogens that can look very similar to nutrient deficiencies. Uh, so one of the things we want to look at is, you know, it's really unlikely uh, that we're going to have a nutrient deficiency affecting one plant in our landscape uh, and then not affecting the plants that are in that same area. They're all living in the same soil. They've probably been fertilized very similarly. Uh, so nutrient deficiencies are, are tending to be, you know, fairly uniform across the plants that we have, uh, particularly plants of the same species. Um, the, the symptoms are all going to appear on those plants pretty much at the same time because all the plants are being affected by the same thing. Oftentimes where we would see a, a biotic problem, a fungus or a bacterium, uh, it's going to start affecting one plant or, or a small number of plants and then spread throughout the environment. Uh, in terms of, of abiotic diseases, watering is, is very frequently uh, a problem we run into and it can be overwatering or underwatering. Uh, and is really one of the first things that I think about when I come out to a landscape to see what the problem may be is, is you know, is that plant located in a low area where water is going to sit for a long period of time? Uh, is it in a really dry area? Have we had a lot of rain or very little rain? And that's you know, the sort of thing that you would want to consider when we think about watering as, as potentially a, a, a problem source in the home landscape. Uh, of course, we do occasionally run into pesticide exposure as well. Uh, fortunately, not something that you tend to have to scout for uh, because you, you know when you have applied a pesticide in your home landscape, uh, you just wanna make sure that we're careful with those uh, and you know, kind of keep track of what you have applied and when you've applied it. Uh, and if you start to see problems after you have applied that, that herbicide in these instances, uh, you want to kind of take a look at that and see if what you're uh, you know, observing on the plant would match what you would expect for different kinds of pesticide exposure. Uh, Roundup will vary uh, or glyphosate more properly will very commonly uh, lead to a kind of, uh, you know, the leaves looking kind of bleached. Uh, 2,4-D or, or the other kinds of herbicides that are in that class uh, will tend to make the plants grow excessively and in, in kind of bizarre ways. Uh, so the plants will look kind of stretched out uh, as a, a way to identify those different kinds of pesticide exposure. So when we talk about biotic pathogens, there's a, a range of, of different kinds. Um, there are fungi, and, and by, by far and away, fungi are the most frequent uh, cause of biotic disease. Uh, much, much less than that are bacteria. Uh, less than that would be viruses and nematodes are, while fairly common, uh, very frequently go un unnoticed. Uh, there are a, a few other groups of biotic pathogens uh, that we, we won't consider, things like phytoplasmas or virions and uh, prions uh, that, that aren't likely to show up in a home landscape but, but are out there. When we talk about fungal disease, uh, fungal disease can be foliar or vascular, can occur on the leaves, uh, or it can be sort of inside of the plant. Um, so when we're looking at lesions that are caused by a fungal disease, uh, very frequently you can see, as you see in the, the picture up there in the middle, uh, you'll see the, the presence of spores uh, or the presence of, of little growing threads called mycelia uh, coming away from those lesions. Uh, as a really good way to uh, identify that what, what's going on is a fungus. Uh, of course, fungal lesions uh, may also appear on the, the stems or the trunk of plants. Uh, in extreme cases, you, you, with larger trees, uh, you may actually see shelf fungi uh, or things like that growing out of the side of the tree. Uh, vascular diseases or you know, diseases that get into the, the xylem and phloem cells of the plant. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to identify them on a single plant, 
um, but you're usually going to observe these as a wilt. Uh, oftentimes that'll occur at the, the top of the plant, move down, uh, though occasionally it will occur uh, that the, the bottom leaves will wilt first and it moves up the plant. The only real way to really confirm that these are present is to, to cut the plant and to look inside that, uh, that trunk to kind of identify the discoloration that's a result of that fungal disease. So if you have a, a number of that kind of plant, you can sacrifice one, uh, look at that vascular tissue in the, the stem of the plant uh, and possibly see that discoloration. Uh, bacterial diseases uh, similarly can occur uh, on the leaves uh, or on the fruit. Uh, you can see lesions on the, the stems and trunks as well. Uh, one thing that is particularly useful in identifying bacterial diseases uh, is that oftentimes you'll, you'll, they'll have kind of what we call a water-soaked appearance. Uh, on leaves where you can take it off the plant, you kind of need to hold it up to the light uh, and you can see around the edge of that lesion, uh, there'll be kind of a, a blister-like appearance uh, where it looks like there's a, a fluid there. Uh, occasionally you will see a kind of ooze coming out of that infected area, uh, which really is just the, the bacteria that can get splashed around and spread to other areas. Uh, so, you know, if you have that kind of ooze coming out of the plant, uh, that is a good sign, good sign that what we're dealing with is a bacterial disease. Um, very quickly, uh, just like you can with fungal diseases, uh, you can have bacterial wilts, uh, and that would be where the bacteria get into that vascular tissue, very much the same way as what you would see with a fungus. Uh, and one way that can be used to, to figure out uh, if what you're dealing with is a wilt that's caused by bacteria, Again, you have to sacrifice a plant to do this, uh, but if you, if you take a very uh, good sharp knife and clean knife and, and cut that stem uh, and hold the cut stem to the, to the other end, uh, you can slowly pull that apart and occasionally you'll see kind of a thread-like material um, between, the two, uh, between the two cuts pieces of stem, uh, which is again a kind of sign that you have the bacteria in there. Uh, another method that's used for that is cutting the stem and putting it into a glass of uh, water, holding it up to the light, and occasionally uh, you'll see kind of a milky substance coming out of that uh, that's a sign that you have that bacteria kind of moving out of the stem into the water. Uh, in my experience, uh, seeing that streaming is, is fairly difficult, uh, and you kind of have to have the, the right conditions going on for that to happen. Uh, so I consider putting the two pieces of stem together just to be a little bit more reliable uh, as a way to look for that bac uh, bacterial disease. Uh, virus diseases also affect plants. <clears throat> uh, going back to our definitions, a virus is a submicroscopic obligate intracellular parasite. Uh, just to break that down, viruses are very, very small. They actually uh, are, are far too small to uh, see with a, a light microscope, we have to use a fancy kind of microscope like a, a transmission electron microscope in order to see them. Um, they require cells uh, of another organism to, uh, in order to replicate, uh, and they, they, they have to be able to get into those cells. Uh, some things that are significant about viruses is that, first of all, the, the vast majority of them are transmitted by insects. So uh, a lot of virus diseases are moved around by insects like aphids and whiteflies. Uh, and so noting that you've had those populations of aphids and whiteflies is, is really important as part of identifying whether you have a virus disease. Uh, another thing that can be particularly uh, in, you know, indicate that you might have a virus uh, is that virus symptoms don't tend to affect one part of a plant and not another. So you tend to see those symptoms kind of distributed everywhere on the plant uh, when you have a virus, uh, though it's oftentimes a lot easier to see those symptoms on the new growth of the plant than it is on older growth. Uh, one of the most frustrating uh, symptoms for, uh, disease, for virus diseases is, is just stunting. 
uh, where the plant doesn't quite grow as much. Uh, and so uh, virus, you know, identifying virus disease can be quite difficult. Uh, looking for nematodes also can be difficult. Nematodes are unsegmented worms uh, that are present in the soil uh, and feed on plant roots. Uh, plants that are infected with them uh, tend to be yellowish and dwarfed. Um, <clears throat> and one thing that is useful is, is that they tend to affect all the plants in an area, uh, and that area kind of slowly expands. Uh, by far, the, the most common nematode that we have a problem with is the root knot nematode. Uh, if you pull up the root system, uh, you can see the, those fairly obvious knots uh, that you see pictured here uh, on the root system. This, this is a kind of extreme example, uh, but you see those nodules there uh, where the female nematode has gotten on there and, and formed that gall around, the, around herself uh, on the root. Uh, very characteristic. Uh, very easy to identify. Uh, one thing that I really encourage people to do uh, for, for gardening in general and, uh, and really particularly for insect and disease uh, pest problems uh, is keeping a record of what goes on in your garden. Uh, having you know, those, uh, re those uh, records is really useful uh, when we think about you know, what we're likely to run into. Uh, it lets us remember what we've done in order to manage particular pests or different problems in the home landscape, you know, whether that particular method of dealing with the problem was effective. Uh, it's going to, you know, it, it's going to be very difficult year to year to remember what date different things happened, uh, what our weather was like. So having that written down uh, can be really helpful year to year. Uh, and uh, some things to collect, you know, what plant varieties uh, are, are being planted. Uh, you know, I go back very frequently and I look at plants in my own landscape and, and being able to remember what variety those are can be really helpful, uh, not only to me, but it, you know, if somebody like me is coming to my landscape to help me identify a problem, being able to tell them what variety of plant we're dealing with can be very helpful. You know, when pests appeared, uh, how good that plant is performing, uh, you know, when we made specific observations, if we can take pictures, that's even better, uh, what kind of management techniques we've used, uh, and whether they worked for us. And in that way, you know, over time, as we accumulate more information, uh, we can get better at identifying those problems uh, and using management techniques that are going to work in our landscape. Uh, so that is, those are my comments uh, for today. I'm going to.